Hey, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting our students to learn what we teach. And I am Rob Alvarez. I'm the founder of Professor Game and professor of gamification and games-based solutions at IE Business School, EFMD, EBS University, and many other places around the world. And if this content is for you, then please go ahead and subscribe to our email list for free at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Hey, Engagers, so this is a special one. Today we are recording from a cafe in Madrid because we have Anthony's visiting Madrid today. Anthony's, how are you? I am doing good. I'm enjoying the sun of Madrid and I'm really <laughs> happy to see you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. So... I think we haven't really done this before. We did have the interview with Rasmussen from Lego Serious Play. Yeah. There was no other way I would get him otherwise. So when I was doing the workshop, I interviewed him again with my phone as I am doing right now. So engagers, however you hear this interview, you will probably notice that it, the sound is a little bit different, <laughs> right? And that's fine. We try it every now and then, but I wanted to see, have an update. Like I don't, yes. we don't get to meet our gamification colleagues in person too often, except in conferences. So I wanted to take the opportunity to see what Anthony's has been in the gamification world. So yeah, what can you say to that, Anthony's? How, how have you been? We, I, um, well, what can I say? I first a little comment on what you just said. I hope <laughs> we don't get to meet in person often. It never ceases to surprise me how the pandemic made it a norm to meet online, to work online, to finish a project online, everything fully online. Yeah. I remember before that, it would be a thing that part of the project you're dealing with would be the remote, but yeah. you would first meet in person and start something in person, and then you would do some things remotely. This current norm that we meet online, we do everything online, then we finish everything online, we never meet in person, that became a norm during the pandemic, and it is weird. It is, it is weird. That's what I want to say. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's completely weird. Yeah. Honest. I mean, I, I, don't get me wrong. I am enjoying that a lot. When I was working full time, one of the perks I absolutely enjoyed was the fact that I could work from home every single day yeah. and I didn't have to move from that. I had a perk as well. You know, I had the Madrid office, so I could go there. I started forcing myself to go once a week yeah, yeah, and that was nice. But the fact that you could do that remotely, especially now with kids at home, it is fantastic. But you know, not meeting people ever. <laughs> <laughs> You're starting to miss the, the 3D. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a bit much. It could be a bit much. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to gamification, I, I'm actually super excited because now I am at a good stage. Like I've been through my ups and downs, ups and downs <laughs> especially in the past few months, but now I'm on a route upwards, let's say, and uh, we will not meet in person again in Gamification Europe, but that's mm, when I will I don't think so. present more visually, let's say. This will be the first uh, audio <laughs> <laughs> presentation of this, but I will present there my US project and my biggest yet. It's Amazing. called Climate for All, and it's a project that well, it's debatable whether it's gamification or games-based learning, more the latter. <laughs> but the whole project has to do with developing games that help build skills in sustainability among young people. That's, okay. that's the basics of it. Okay. Yeah. And, and, so, and it's already ongoing? You already it, designed it or are you the process? It has just begun. <laughs> okay. I spent some months with five partner organizations and we basically developed the projects properly. Then we applied for an Erasmus Plus grant to basically kick it off. And we got the grant. <laughs> and we just started working on the, on, the, on the project. So the project has basically four different phases. And we are currently at the very first phase, which has to do with researching. And what we're researching is essentially we are examining what games already exist out there that have to do with sustainability or building skills related to sustainability. Okay. And... Yeah, we're play testing. We're trying to figure out what gaps exist in these games so we can then fill them with a second phase where we'll be developing our own games. When I'm talking about things, we're not doing video games. We decided that we want to focus on, on more tangible games like board games, card games, RPG games, uh, live action RPG games like that. So we are on our own. <laughs> you, 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 we probably want to look into the work of the multiplayer classroom, uh, uh, Sheldon. Yeah, Professor Sheldon, Lee Sheldon. Yeah, 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 yeah. He what does a lot of, like, that's part of his specialty. And he, he always likes to say that he, he can do game-based learning with the PowerPoint. <laughs> he loves yeah. to say that, right? Like, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the only tool he needs, and, you know, it, it is fantastic. I had him in the show a few 
years ago, I think now. But both of his books are, are fantastic for that because yeah. one of them was the foundations and all that. And the other one is full of examples, like how he did this very, very specifically. So I think, I don't know, I think it could be a start point. Yeah, yeah, I'm aware of the word. It is. It's, it's, <laughs> it's quite impressive. It, it's one of the things that gets you out of, uh, of this, uh, oh, I need to do this and this and this and that. I need to fulfill a million different conditions in order for me to start. He's just like, no, you just need the PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. No, that's lovely. That's lovely. And if I asked you, and, and again, I know there's a bunch of, uh, there's always non-disclosure agreements and all this. What is the latest project that you can discuss that has actually, besides from this one, which is at the starting phase, is there something that you can talk to us about, some results that you've had or some project that you worked on lately or not so lately? Well, yeah, in the past few years, I've been focusing more and more on games. So okay. there is, for example, a previous project to that. That was also about games for sustainability. Amazing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, through that, we built a number of board games and uh, simulation games, we called them then. Now I know that they are mostly LARPs. I didn't know the term back then. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, th there's this previous project called the Key 2 Games, K, the number two, and games. And the idea was to develop the different board games and simulation games that can be used in an international youth work environment. So we did that. and. I am um, co-authoring two games, mostly invested my time in one of those games. And it's a collaborative uh, board game, like in the style of pandemic, but focusing on the climate crisis. And I work mostly on the narrative. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, so that's, that, that is an example of a project that, uh, that is finished now and it's released and I'm really proud of. So I could talk about that. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I have a question, a follow-up from, because it, it maybe relates to the two projects you've mentioned. I love uh, the physicality of all these games. Yeah. The big question people typically have is, yeah, that's fine. But especially if you want to talk about sustainability, you don't want it for, you know, a, a privileged you. Yeah. How does that reach the vast majorities or, or a, a, let's call it a lot of people? Yeah. How do you do that? Or how have you been doing that, actually? Yeah. So both this previous project and the current project are designed with that in mind. And the main thing that we went with is release the materials for free. Okay. <laughs> Have them uh, at the website that you can visit. You can download, print, and play at home. Okay. And when it comes to the extra materials that you may have to use, you can design the game so that you can use a multitude of different materials, like from recycling tokens from previous board games that you have to using, I don't know, peanuts, to using whatever <laughs> you can use as a token. So, okay. yeah, the main idea behind how to make it accessible is with the limitation that the internet uh, has. Like, yeah. not everybody has internet, but we are at the stage in yeah, most uh, people species do. that a vast majority of people do have at least internet access. So if you give them the possibility to play your game at their home without having to spend any money, that's one way to do it. So there's a an immediate follow-up that comes to mind. Yes. Who pays for that? Who pays for that? So <laughs> <laughs> these two projects got kicked off by a grant from the European Union called okay. Gas Plus that is funding mostly mobilities. You do projects and it funds you to basically implement uh, the different aspects of this project. The main issue that we discovered, I, I have a lot of experience with that and uh, a lot of my experience has to do with international youth work. So one big issue that I face is that you end up producing uh, materials of amazing quality, resources and reports that you can read that are high quality. But then when you finish the project, it's put in a shelf and forgotten. Sidelined, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the reason for that is money. <laughs> because uh, youth workers, trainers, uh, game developers, whoever works in projects like that, they need to survive somehow. They need to get money from something. So they finish one project, they go to the next in order to get money. And the way the projects are structured or more utilized in practice, it kind of leads you to forget one and go to the next and then go to the next. So with this new project that I mentioned before, the Climate for All project, this is one of the problems we're trying to address. That's why now in our current research phase, we are basically bringing back games from previous projects that we created, other people have created. We're bringing them back to the surface. That's one thing. And the other thing is that halfway through the project, it turns into a social enterprise. So the materials will remain for free. You can download and print and play at home. But if you want a professional to facilitate a session for you, then you pay for that. 
Okay. So similar to, uh, I don't know, what, what is the, uh, the the business model canvas that the material is for free, but <laughs> if you pay a consultant for a session yeah, yeah. on that material, we follow the same logic. Like the materials are free, but if you want an expert to basically work with, then you pay them. Make and sure the marketing uh, yeah. is also included in the grant then so yes. that people know about it. That's yes, yes. Really, yeah, really absolutely. Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. That sounds great. Sounds great. Hopefully, you know, best of luck. Well, well it is. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, we'll be seeing some some results from that uh, in gain education Europe and elsewhere. Yes, yes, yes. The the page is already up. It's climate for all. The four is a number. Dot org. Nice. So you can already see some things there about your project, <laughs> and um, yeah, like I said, they becoming a sustainable thing in the long term requires being financially sustainable. Yeah. So that's a big part of the project that is. I would say innovative in comparison to other projects that I've done in the past, because it basically comes from, uh, I initiated this project and it comes from addressing different pain points that I have faced. <laughs> One is the fact that I also had to jump from project to project because I needed the money from the next project. And it's exhausting. It well. is exhausting. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And, and like you were saying then, and the first thing that, I mean, of course, it's super exhausting and individually you have your own struggles, but there's also a huge factor, which is, you don't do it for the money yeah. or just for the money today. Yeah, exactly. You do it because you want to have an impact. Exactly. And if you don't do the follow-up, the impact is going to be 1%. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, I've been working with nonprofits for about 20 years now. And that's the main problem that I see is there is this logic that either you go for profit and you work for a company or you go completely voluntary and you work for a non-profit. And you struggle. And <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there is this... Um, this false dilemma, you either go for the money or you go for the impact. We live in an era where you can actually combine the two. Oh, yeah. There are two problems. If you focus only on the money, you forget the impact and you need the impact for a society that, you know, is better for all. And if you go only for the impact, you don't get the financial support that enables you to continue to do these things. And so what I faced in volunteering with the NGOs is that the volunteers are short-lived. Like, you cannot make a long-term plan because... Nobody stays for too long because they need the money from somewhere else to yeah. survive. So that's why I, I take a social entrepreneurship approach to this. You focus on the impact, but you come up with a business plan that can keep financing this impact. So through the same project, you can enlarge that. There's something that we teach in, in supply chain management called mm. the, the triple A advantage, I think is the name. And the thing is that you're basically, as a company, forget about social entrepreneurship, it's just mere entrepreneurship. Yeah. You can get better results, especially with the awareness that you have now. And again, it's just good business yeah. by focusing, of course, on the financial aspect, but also on the impact on the society, the, 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 the overall and the environment. Yeah. So if you are able to put these three together and make a positive impact on the three, actually your financial impact on your company can be maximized. Yeah. That is where you get the trip. Yeah, I think it's a triple A advantage. I'm, I'm going to teach it yeah. in like 10 weeks. Yeah, so I need to <laughs> look into it again. But it is something that is working. There's plenty of great examples. Yes. Again, from, you know, small companies who are doing this and from huge companies. Mm -hmm. One that I would like to remember very much is, um, it's I think it's the Patagonia people yeah. that, that do their clothes. One of the problems with clothing is that once they're done, right, you pass, if you want to be socially aware, environmentally aware, you want to pick them up, right? Yeah, yeah. And see what you do with them. Usually what happens, they end up, you know, in a dump or somewhere. They're stored somewhere. So it's waste, essentially. These people are saying, look, you know what? These clothes have lived the life. Mm -hmm. And we have a bunch of people who are great sewing. So they grab the clothes and they start using the piece of clothes. They're still working because it's essentially broken. Yeah. Clothes, right? yeah. It's not just about fixing them. They create new clothing from that, right? So yeah. that reversal of just thing of grabbing back those clothes, it costs money, but then they also sell it and the clothes are having a second life. And you can even, you know, they, they also use the sort of emotional arguments. And, oh, yes, yeah, had a life, it's been as it. You could even forget about that. Like you could be thinking it up in terms of business, business, yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. But you're having an impact on those people who are getting that job thanks to that. Because it's also, I think it's a community uh, thing because you see the people and they're clearly from the specific region. You're having the environmental impact and you're definitely making money. Yeah, that has a lot to do with gamification because gamification in its essence is an assessment of motivation and using the psychology of motivation to lead people towards desired actions. Yep. So you design a system that basically motivates people to do things. 
<laughs> and when it comes to companies. Hopefully, hopefully it was ethics, right? We, we've talked about ethics many times in the podcast, but yeah, if, I mean, it's easy to forget and people forget about it as well. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you don't. I mean, yeah. That's not what I meant, but yeah. It's, it's, yeah, but that's, that's exactly what I, what I wanted to say. Basically, it, it works internally and externally. If you have an overall system of values and you put that as part of your narrative, then people will buy more from you because they associate you with the yeah. input you have on society and the environment that works externally. You get more sales or more uh, partners, more customers, whatever you want to call them, that works externally, but it also works internally. If you treat your workers, you yeah. know, <laughs> ethically, yeah. you create happy workers and happy workers are more productive. So basically, you get better productivity and better sales if you start from an ethical point of view. There's... What I was talking about the Triple E. This is all coming back now from my class. I've been teaching <laughs> this subject for a few years now. And now pay attention, and engage your uh, <laughs> special class for you. <laughs> so there's there's a matrix where you have one is of course uh, the the term in which you will be getting the benefits. Yeah. Short term or long term. Yes. When you're building a brand, it's usually about longer term, right? It's not you you, you start building a brand and just build your brand. It's not you're going to sell twenty percent more. Yeah. You might be selling twenty percent more in the long run or a hundred percent more. If they, people start associating, but but it's not immediate, right? Yeah. It's not something that happens overnight. But there's also in the short run, there's things that happen immediately. Some people see, oh, this is an environmentally friendly brand. And, they, and you really are because the greenwashing is a thing as well. Yep. Yep. And the people who are really interested in that, they start buying as well, right? So yep. it works in that sense. And you also start cutting costs mm -hmm. in many cases. When you do it right, I mean, you start thinking about environment and about people, you can even cut costs. It does not mean you have to fire people. Forget about firing people to cut, just to cut costs. That's not the way it works. Not always, right? <laughs> and there, there's the other axis is about if you want to reduce the negative or increase the positive. Yeah. Right? So you do some things to say, we are doing these great things, or we know we have a negative impact. So we're reducing the negative impact. Mm -hmm. Think planes, right? I don't think, at least in the medium run, that we'll get planes that are net zero or that are positive for the environment, yeah. right? Yeah. But you can get to see how you can reduce your footprint. Yeah. Well, when it comes to flights, if there are many things you can do. You can almost eliminate private jets. <laughs> There's no reason for those. Or you can limit flights to what really needs to be a flight, not like that happened now, a distance that you can do on land. Again, there's many things that you can do, but but that's the thing. Sometimes it's reducing the negative, and sometimes it's increasing the yeah, negative. yeah, yeah. But that that's a matrix. And you were talking about you know the long run. The yes, 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 yes. So that's that that just came uh, immediately to the th these are narratives that we want to use for our games in the Climate for All project, by the way. So like, if you have more uh, narratives to bring to the table, there are these three A's. The <laughs> there's your thing. Or... There's a reading. I'm not sure if it's available for free. Uh -huh. uh, I know at the in school we. They always, like what we need, they, they, they just purchase it for the students. Let me see if I can find out. Uh, it's called the AAA Advantage. Yeah, okay. If you Google that, you'll find a lot of literature on that. Okay. But I, I think it's it's a good one to, to sort of keep in mind that there is a possibility to do this and actually make it good business. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. my students are business students, not social business or mm -hmm. environmental business. No, they're business students. And that's fine. They can end up being social entrepreneurs, yep. environmental entrepreneurs, but their their major is in business, right? Yes. But it can be good business to do good stuff. <laughs> that, that's that's basically what I what I wanted to make sure we we get to and and you know there's well we, we get into all sorts of things but again there's the environment but let's not forget about the impact on the people yeah and yeah. the communities around and inside of your own company it's a system uh, and your company you as an individual the social environment the physical environment these are all parts of a system and I think and I'll finish with that like. Games are compact systems. Yeah. So they are the best way to teach people to think in systems. Yeah. That's that's why I'm doing sports. systems thinking. Yeah. yeah. I hadn't heard that in a while. You know, Amy Joe Kim is all about talking about systems. You know, in thinking, so a significant part of it is systems thinking. System thinking, design thinking, design, game design. Yeah. Play games and you learn to think in systems. And we need to think in systems to change systems. <laughs> I mentioned that I would be in, in Amsterdam. I'm going to be in a conference called Edutech Europe. Mm -hmm. But in the hotel I'm staying, yeah. which is the Arcade Hotel, they have something called the Arcade Talk. So I'm going to be doing an Arcade Talk. I'm finishing up the details, but it's probably going to have something along the lines of what you can do. Because it's, it's a gamer hotel, essentially, right? So I'm trying to speak to gamers. I need to stay there. <laughs> oh, yeah. This would be my fourth time at the hotel. Okay. The, times I've been, the three times I've been in Amsterdam, I've stayed at that hotel. Oh, wow. I love it. I can't 
speak well enough about uh, Dan and that hotel. Right before the pandemic, he was just about to open in Barcelona, and the pandemic came in. Yeah, oops. That's it. Now, uh, but I think they're they're going to have be back at the expansion plans hopefully soon. It's an amazing hotel. If you're looking for five stars, four stars, that's not the place. Yeah. If you're looking for a hotel where you're comfortable with playing board games, with having comics around, having a video game, a old console inside of your room, or a place where you can play right outside in the common area, that's the hotel you want. To stay. Yeah. Okay. Now I <laughs> stay next. <laughs> when you go to Utrecht, if you pass by Amsterdam, say spend the night. Definitely go there. I, I will pass by you on my way out. <laughs> 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 I have to now. <laughs> Amazing. So this was a fantastic talk. I wanted to make sure that we had this talk and take the opportunity of being together and doing this live interview. I'm engaged. You'll be seeing this very, very soon right after we, we had this talk. We'll be seeing it next Monday. So thank you very much, Anthony, for having, you know, we had some coffee together, for having this talk. It was a amazing talk before, and I'm sure that the minutes we'll have after will be amazing as well. However, Anthony, however engagers, as you know, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game open. Hey, Engagers, thank you for listening to the Professor Game Podcast. And as you know, this was a slightly different type of interview. So if you would like more interviews like this one we had with Antonis, I can't promise I'll be every week face-to-face with a fellow gamification practitioner. However, I can be more mindful of these opportunities. And every time I get a chance, maybe I can do something like this. If this is something that you're interested in, please let me know. Probably the best way is if you're subscribed to our email list, just answer to any of our past emails. If not, go to professorgame.com slash subscribe and get started on our email list. And as you know, that is absolutely for free. You'll get a welcome email. You can answer to that email. You'll be in contact with me. And of course, as always, I know I do this every single time, but it is important for the growth of the podcast and the growth of the podcast means we get to do better content in the future and perhaps offer new stuff for you. So before you go on to your next mission, please remember to subscribe or follow. This is absolutely for free using whatever podcast app you're using and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.